Hello and welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. I'm sitting here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a great message on forgiveness. And we have a few questions uh, that you sent in that we're gonna answer here on Postscript. But before that, let's listen to Timothy Atik preach now. Well, howdy! All right. Hey, uh, there's no better way to start off uh, a sermon than with a little Taylor Swift. Am I right? (laughs) Merry Christmas, people. Some of y'all are like, who's Taylor Swift? Okay, now you know. Uh, Taylor Swift is the person who sang that song and is a pretty big sensation in our country. But Taylor Swift... Uh, sings a song called Bad Blood, and she just basically talks about this idea of having bad blood with other people in her life and talking about problems with other people that cannot be solved. And so it just has me thinking, uh, what's the bad blood in our lives? So let me just ask you, and I think it's a fitting time for us to be talking about this because you just spent time with people that you might have some bad blood with. (laughs) And so let me just ask you to think real quick, who in your life do you have a little bad blood with? And some of you might be thinking, I don't, I don't know, let me just help you process it a little. Uh, who in this world really bothers you? Like who in this world do you have a hard time being around? Whose name do you struggle hearing? Who in this world has really hurt you? Some of you, the question for you is, who in this world do you really hate? Here's what I've realized just from my own personal experience in life. Uh, The song Bad Blood by Taylor Swift is a fun song to sing, but it's a really tough song to live. It is a really tough song to live. There are few things in life that can rob you of the joy that God gives longs for you to experience. Few things can rob you of that joy, like fractured, broken relationships. Let me just tell you what uh, broken relationships or bad blood will do in your life. Bad blood will rob you of your holidays. It will complicate your holiday season. Some of y'all are like, amen, yeah. The last few days have been extremely complicated for me. Uh, Bad blood will keep you up at night. Bad blood will consume your thoughts and bad blood will drain you with feelings of anger, bitterness, and resentment. That's what bad blood will do. Now, some of you might be saying, why are we talking about this right now? Well, let me just tell you what my aim is uh, this week and next week. For the next two weeks, I want us to spend some time talking about our enemy. We all have an enemy, Satan or the devil, and he is a real person with a real agenda, and his goal in your life is to steal from you, to kill you, and destroy you. And that might sound a little harsh, but that is just reality. Every single person in here, whether you realize it or not, when you woke up this morning and you put your feet on the ground, you weren't just stepping into your bedroom, you were actually stepping onto a battlefield with a real enemy. And our enemy has real tactics that he employs in our lives to steal from us. And one of his greatest tactics, one of the greatest ways that he reaches into our lives and steals from us is through the tactic of unforgiveness. And so if you like the label The Devil Wears, that movie The Devil Wears, probably let's just talk about other things that The Devil Wears. The Devil Wears unforgiveness. Next week, we're going to talk about how the devil wears deception. But you need to know one of the greatest tactics that the evil one will use in your life is unforgiveness. Few things will steal your, steal your joy like an unforgiving heart. And so if, if anyone came to mind when I said, who in your life do you have some bad blood with? Where is there fractures in your relationship? If anyone comes to mind, then let me just tell you, the goal of this morning is to fight for our joy. So if you have a Bible, I want you to join me this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
2 Corinthians chapter 2 is where we're going to start. We're not going to be there for long, but all I want to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is show you that unforgiveness truly is a tactic that our enemy uses to steal joy from our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let me just read you verses 5 through 11. It says this, now if anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive indeed. What, have, uh, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Why? Here's the most important part of the passage, verse 11. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. So all eyes on me. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we're really flying in the dark here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul does not give us really any information on what's going on. All that we know is that there is a person who did something that was so significant that not just Paul felt wronged by it, but a good majority of the people in the community at the church in Corinth. A good majority of people felt wronged by this person's actions. And so there's definitely been some bad blood at play. And we don't know what this person has done, and we don't know exactly how the church responded specifically to this man's offense. But what we do know is that the church took action and they executed church discipline upon this person who offended them. And so there's this bad blood at play, and what Paul does is he steps in and he calls the church in Corinth to forgive this person. And the reason that he calls them to forgive is because of the tactic that the evil one uses in our lives, and it's the tactic of unforgiveness. Look again at what he says in verse 11. He's calling them to forgive. He uses some form of the word forgive five different times in seven verses. And the reason that he's calling them to forgive is verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his Designs, one of the devil's designs, another translation is schemes. One of his schemes is unforgiveness. And Paul is saying, hey, one of the reasons that we're going to take a step and forgive is because we don't want to be outwitted. And that word, that the Greek word that's been translated outwitted can also be translated as robbed. He's saying we don't want to be robbed. Because that's what unforgiveness will do. If you allow unforgiveness to move in and make itself at home in your life, you will get robbed. It will steal your joy. But even beyond that, what the evil one wanted to do in the church in Corinth is he wanted to rob the church in Corinth of two things, intimacy. Vertical and horizontal intimacy. Intimacy with God and intimacy with others. That's the first thing he wanted to steal from them was intimacy. But the second thing he wanted to steal was impact. Because just a few chapters later in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is going to tell the church in Corinth, hey, we are ambassadors for Christ. God has actually given us the ministry of reconciliation. The gospel, the message of Christianity is a message about forgiveness it's a message about how God has come to us and he has done something to take us who are enemies and now we become children because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is the message of the gospel that God is able to do something so significant in our lives that he could forgive anything that we've ever done and we could be brought into right relationship with a perfect, holy God. Now, how can a people who were who refuse to forgive each other, be a witness to the world of the forgiveness that they've found in Jesus Christ. How is that even possible? It's not. 
And so Paul is saying, take a step, because if you don't, you're gonna be robbed. You're gonna be robbed of intimacy with God and the people around you, and you're also gonna be robbed of your impact. And that will steal your joy. So Paul's message to his friends in Corinth was, hey, wake up, you have an enemy, you are at war, and he's trying to steal from you through the avenue of unforgiveness. So take a step and forgive. Paul's message to the church in Corinth is my message to you this morning. If there's bad blood in your life, if there's any fractured relationships, if there's any relationships in your present or in your past that you can look and say, you know what, not everything is okay. There's wounds there, there's hurt there, then my message to you, what I wanna call you to this morning, right here on the heels of Thanksgiving, is I wanna call you to forgive. And some of you might be sitting there saying, that is really not the message that I wanted to hear at church this morning. And some of you might be sitting there saying, you don't know me and you don't get me and you don't know where I've been and you don't know what he did and you don't know how deep it hurt how deep the hurt goes, and you know what, you are exactly right. And let me just be clear from the start. Um, There is no way in one, one message that I could even come close to addressing all of the unique scenarios that are in this room today. So let me just say that I understand that that is the case. At the same time, every single one of us longs for wholeness and joy. And I promise you, in the end, the person who will get hurt the most by your anger, bitterness, and resentment will be you. And so may we be people this morning who fight for joy. If it's not the message you wanna hear, that's okay. I think about what C.S. Lewis said, he said this. He said, we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. (laughs) And he's right. Forgiveness is a beautiful concept as long as you're the one who's having to deal with forgiveness. But here's what I know. I think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verse nine, one of the Beatitudes, he said this, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That word blessed, it's the Greek word makarios. And makarios can be translated two ways. It can be translated blessed, and it can also be translated happy. So Jesus is saying, happy are the peacemakers, and he's not talking about this superficial happiness. No, he's talking about deep-rooted joy. He's saying, uh, joyful are those who pursue peace. So here's Jesus saying, hey, if the thing that your heart longs for is joy, if what you really want is happiness, this deep-rooted happiness, then Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the pathway to your joy. And peace is the pathway to joy. Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because they shall be called sons of God. If you think about it, when you choose to pursue peace, you know what you're doing? You're reflecting the Father. This is what children of God do. Children of God model what they've seen their Father do. Blessed are the peacemakers. If this is what we truly long for, then this morning I wanna just call us to fight for our joy, and I'm gonna do that by just giving you four key truths that you need to know when dealing with the bad blood in your life. The first key truth that you need to know when dealing with the bad blood in your life is this, forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the beautiful news of Christianity. Let's just be clear. We're not just here this morning to be religious people. We're not just here this morning to be better people. No, we have come into this place. We've made the effort to get here today because we are convinced that we have really incredible news to rally around and celebrate. And that news is that through faith in who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us on the cross, we are completely forgiven today and forevermore. That God now looks at those who have placed faith in Jesus Christ 
And he looks at us and feels complete peace. Just think about that right now. How do you think God feels about you? Right in this moment. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have invited Christ into your life to forgive you of all of your sins, it doesn't matter how you feel. The fact is that you are permanently forgiven and you have permanent peace with God. That is your reality, that every drop of wrath that God had towards your sin has been poured out onto, onto his son, Jesus Christ. And so now he, in his kindness, lavishes you with his love, acceptance, approval, and favor because he has forgiven you. This is your reality. Now, if you've experienced that type of forgiveness, and if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, then what you're really telling the world is, I have experienced the forgiveness of a perfect and holy God. If you've experienced that forgiveness, then it's only right to extend that forgiveness to the people around us. But that's a choice you have to make. And, and really the fork in the road is this. When it comes to bad blood in your relationships, you're either going to do things God's way or your way. See, you can, you can do things your way. And you've got many different options of how you will handle the bad blood in your life. Like you can take a page out of Carrie Underwood's playbook in her song Before He Cheats or... Uh, yeah, what does she say? She says, I dug my key into the side of his pretty little souped up four wheel drive, carved my name into his leather seats. <laughs> I took a Louisville slugger to both headlights, slashed a hole in all four tires. Maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. A little rough on the landing. <laughs> but that's what you can do. It's revenge. If you were hurt, you know what? Hurt people hurt people. And so if you've been hurt, you can, you can spread the hurt. You can inflict the pain that was inflicted upon you. That's one option. Another option, if you want to deal with things your way instead of being a problem solver, you can be a problem spreader. You can spread your problem to the world. You can subtweet, and some of y'all have no clue what that is. <laughs> you can get on Facebook, you can get on your social media platforms, and you can say something to that person who hurt you without naming their name. You can just say what you want to say in a passive aggressive way, and the world can look on and be like, she didn't say his name, but we know his name. <laughs> or you can just run your mouth. And you can sit down and you can unload your hurt upon any poor soul who will listen. And what you're doing in that moment is you're just stacking up your team, right? Because if you're going to choose sides, let me make sure that you choose my side. And so you're a problem spreader instead of a problem solver. You can cut people out of your life. You can refuse to respond you can refuse to talk to them. You can refuse to enter into reconciling conversations. You can simply cut them out. Or there's just the good old fashioned fight where you just unload, you just seek to level them. You yell at them, you cuss at them, you, you are passive aggressive or just straight up aggressive in the way you talk and the goal is to level the person who you have bad blood with. You can handle things on your own. But if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, the reason that you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ is because you've said, I've come to a place where I've surrendered my life to someone else. Someone else gets to play king in my life. And here's God's way. God tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love this verse because I think that it, it understands our situations. Listen to what it says. It says, 
if it is possible, which implies that there's times where it's not possible. There are times where it's not possible. There are unique and extreme circumstances where pursuing um, reconciling conversations will actually cause more hurt than help. And some of y'all just need to know, I didn't just give the majority of you a caveat. I gave a few of you a caveat because there are extreme circumstances where it's just not possible if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. You know what that means? It means you can't control how someone else responds. You can't control if someone else will apologize to you. You can't control if someone will accept your apology. That's not your responsibility. Your only job is to keep your side of the street clean. That's all you can do. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is God's way. This is what he calls us to do. So you're gonna make a choice. You're either gonna do things your way or God's way. But you need to know forgiven people forgive people. Now before I move on to our second point, I just wanna make sure you know how serious God is about forgiveness. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter six, verses 14 and 15. He says this, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Scary verse. Let me tell you what's happening here. There, I need to make a distinction between forensic forgiveness and family forgiveness. Forensic forgiveness is a once in time, it's a moment in time forgiveness between you and God where God extends forgiveness for everything that you have done and will ever do. It's a moment in time uh, forgiveness that happens for all of eternity when you put your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Family forgiveness is the forgiveness that is necessary to maintain intimacy within the context of a family. I believe that here Jesus is talking about family forgiveness because these two verses come right after the Lord's Prayer and in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us how to pray. How does he tell us to start? Our Father in heaven. See, not everyone can look at God and call him Father. Only children of God can look and call him Father. So Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer to fuel intimacy within the family of God. And so Jesus is saying, hey, if you wanna continue to experience intimacy with God and others, you will have to forgive. Your willingness to forgive others actually impacts God's uh, willingness to maintain deep intimacy, not salvation, but intimacy with you. Let me explain it this way. I've got three boys. If my two older boys, Noah and Andrew, get into a fight, and uh, Andrew feels so wronged by Noah that Andrew refuses to sit at the dinner table with Noah. If he refuses to come to the dinner table and sit down at the table with Noah, he's also making a choice not to sit down at the table with me. And by refusing to sit at the table with Noah, he's actually refusing to sit at the table with me. And because he's gonna miss out on intimacy with Noah, he's actually gonna miss out on intimacy with me. What Jesus is saying here is if you refuse to extend the same type of forgiveness that you have experienced from your perfect heavenly father, then God's not just gonna act like you guys are cool and y'all can be tight and you can have these amazing quiet times where God's just like, no, 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 we're good. No, you are walking in unrepentant sin. And that doesn't mean that God kicks you out of the family. It just means he's not gonna pretend that everything's okay when you are refusing to do what he's called you to do. Forgiveness is extremely important to God. Forgiven people forgive people. The second key truth you need to know when dealing with bad blood in your life is this, time doesn't heal all wounds. It prolongs them. You hear that? Time doesn't heal all wounds, it prolongs them. Let me just see by a show of hands. Uh, Who here has broken a bone? And here's what I mean by that. I'm not talking about like your, your pinky or like you chipped a bone. Like I'm talking about you straight up like 
broke your arm or your leg, that, like that thing was broken in half. Just slip up your hand real quick if you have broken a bone. Okay, you leave your hands up, please. Just put all your hands up. Now, um, uh, keep your hands up if you did nothing about it. Like you just did nothing about it. <laughs> what, you guys went to the doctor? What, because you're impulsive? You didn't want to just let nature take its course and let that thing heal on its own? Why? Because it wouldn't have healed, right? Like something had to be done. A step needed to be taken in order for healing to take place. Why? Because, I mean, just think about it. If I were to fall off the stage, and my wife will tell you, that's a possibility because <laughs> like, hand-eye coordination is not my thing. If I've fallen off this stage and broken my leg and I was just like gimping around for the rest of my life, wouldn't you look and be like, man, what if I was like, just give it a little more time, people? <laughs> like any day now, this thing is gonna be back to normal. No. Why? Because with every step, the, the, the fracture or the break just gets re-broken. And the reality is the longer that you let hurt just dwell with inside of you, there's just things that keep popping up. A thought comes into your mind. You see something. You hear something. Another comment is made. And you know what it does? It just reopens the wound. See, a step has, an intentional step has to be taken to pursue healing. It doesn't matter how much you can sweep under the rug. The reality is there's still something under the rug. You have to deal with it. Time doesn't heal all wounds. It actually prolongs them. So if you've been hurt, you have to take a step. And, and I think that Jesus, he, he shows us the way. You think about what Romans 5, 8 says, it says, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus left heaven and came to earth. He was the offended and he came to us to deal with the offense. And so let me just tell you this, if you've been hurt, uh, God tells us what you should do. Listen to what it says in Matthew 18, 15. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Do you see that? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. See, the Bible is calling you, if you've been hurt, it's calling you to go directly to the person and to tell them how they have wronged you. And here's the thing, I don't know how that will go for you. It might go well, it might not. You have zero control over how someone will respond. But your only responsibility is to give them an opportunity to make it right. See, this is just my personal opinion, but one of the most unfair things that you could ever do is not give someone the opportunity to make things right. You know what? Here's the reality. Sometimes people don't even know what they've done. Sometimes people know exactly what they've done. But give them an opportunity. Give people an opportunity to make it right. Let me just tell you how this is fleshed out in my own life recently. Like within the last month and a half, um, I was driving to work in College Station. I was on the phone with my mom and we were just talking and laughing for the first portion of our conversation and then things turned a little bit more uh, serious. And in the course of our conversation, it was so great how my mom did it because she was very loving and gentle. But in the course of our conversation, she just said, you know what, Timothy, I need you to know that there have been some specific things that you've been doing that have just left me feeling hurt and unloved by you. And I was so thankful for my mom's courage to lovingly and gently and specifically tell me how I've been hurting her because it gave me an opportunity to make things right in that moment. So I said, Mom, I am so sorry. Please forgive me for these things that I have done. 
to leave you feeling hurt or unloved. And you know what has happened? It's brought joy and life back into our relationship. And even our time at Thanksgiving was radically different than it could have been or it would have been if that conversation hadn't taken place. And my mom and I have talked about how good God is that he even brought about that unexpected conversation for us to experience some healing in our relationship. But you know what she did? She gave me an opportunity to make things right. Time doesn't heal all wounds, it prolongs them. The third key truth you need to know when dealing with bad blood in your life is this, forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice, it's not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice, and I think that Jesus, again, gives us the example. Listen to what Jesus said as he hung on the cross in Luke 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Just think, uh, Jesus deserved to be worshipped as a king. That's what he deserved. He deserved to show up in a manger and every year of his life be worshipped as the king of kings and lord of lords. That's what he deserved. Instead, he was... Uh, betrayed by one of the 12, one of the people he had handpicked, he was rejected by his own people, he was arrested, he was falsely accused, he was beaten, whipped to the brink of death, laughed at, mocked, and crucified between criminals. So just think, what else could Jesus have said on the cross? Instead of, Father, forgive them, he could have said, uh, Father, split the earth in half and swallow up these people whole. Father, destroy them. But in the midst of his pain, in the midst of uh, the agony of bearing the weight of the sins of the world, he cried out, Father, forgive them. See, forgiveness was a choice that Jesus made. And it's a choice that you will have to make. Because here's the, here's the reality, the natural reaction to hurt in pain that someone has caused you, the natural response, the natural reaction is anger, bitterness, and resentment. And here's the hard thing, is that we live in a world that says that's your right. Like that anger, that bitterness, that resentment, that's yours, that's what you deserve. No one can take that away from you, that is your right. It's your right to feel angry. It's your right to harbor bitterness and resentment towards that person. Don't, don't give that up. The problem is, the longer you hold on to anger, bitterness, and resentment, it's like weeds overtaking a healthy yard. Anger, bitterness, and resentment, when you leave it unchecked, when you let it move into your soul and make itself at home, they are weeds that will overtake the health in your soul. And the person that will get hurt the most by your anger, bitterness, and resentment are you. I promise you, mark my word, the person who will get hurt the most by those things is you. Forgiveness is a choice. If you've been hurt deeply, the chances of you ever feeling like forgiving a person are slim to none. You might never feel like forgiving someone. Forgiveness is a choice that you have to make in spite of how you feel. When I was preparing for this message, I just Googled uh, families that have forgiven a murderer. And it was really encouraging to see all the different stories that have popped up, especially from the mass shootings that, is, that have taken place. And so I, I think about the uh, church shooting in Charleston uh, a few years ago where Dylan Roof killed nine people uh, within the church. And uh, I read a quote by a daughter of a 70-year-old woman who was killed by Dylan Roof. And here's what this daughter said uh, to her mom's killer. She said, you took something very precious from me, but I forgive you. It hurts me. You hurt a lot of people, but may God forgive you. Do you see what she's saying? She's saying, if we're talking about feelings right now, what I feel is hurt. What I feel is hurt because you took something from me 
And what you took can't be replaced, so that hurts. And you've actually hurt a lot of people. But I forgive you, and may God also forgive you. Do you see it? Forgiveness isn't a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice that you make a lot of times in spite of how you feel. Now let me just say this. For some of you, the hurt is really deep or it's really fresh. And so you're not at the place yet to choose to forgive. And I want you to know that that's okay. I want you to know that there there is some pain in this world that just takes time for you to process to get to the point where you can make a choice to forgive. I do also want to be clear that when I'm calling people to forgive, forgiveness and trust are two totally separate things. By me calling you to forgive a person is not the same as me calling you to then also trust that person and let them have freedom in your life again. That might never be appropriate and that might never be helpful again. But uh, for some of you, maybe this morning is just about you getting a vision for what you will need to do at some point at some point you might have to say, you know what, I have to make a decision. I have to make the choice to forgive. So maybe for a few of you here, your takeaway is, you know what, I'm not there yet, but I want to get there. God, help me. Help me get to that point where I can make that decision to forgive. The last key truth that you need to know when dealing with the bad blood in your life is this. I'm just going to give you my definition of forgiveness. This is it. Forgiveness is giving up your right to be right. That's what forgiveness is. It's giving up your right. It's giving up your right to be right. I want you to think about uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, what Jesus had to do to bring about your forgiveness. It cost Jesus greatly. It did. It cost Jesus something on the cross. He had to endure the wrath of God for your sin and for mine. You need to know forgiveness will cost you something, and I'll tell you what it will cost you. It will cost you your right to be right. It will cost you your right to justice. See, that's what forgiveness is. It's giving up your right to be right. It's giving up your right to justice. It's you saying, you know what? I'm giving up my right to get an apology. That doesn't mean you don't deserve an apology. You probably do deserve an apology. But forgiveness is you coming to a place where you're saying, my life will move forward whether I ever get an apology or not. I refuse to let my life hinge upon someone else's response. My life will move forward because I'm giving up my right for an apology. I'm giving up my right to get even with this person. I give up my right to that. Now, when someone hurts you, natural consequences should take place. But whether those natural consequences ever take place or not, and I think it's okay to want those natural consequences to take place. If if something has been done illegally and the law has been broken, it is okay and right to want the law to, to serve its place in our lives. But forgiveness is you saying whether that ever happens or not. I want wholeness and I want peace. And I will move forward with my life. I will not stall out. And my life will not be defined by this hurt. And so forgiveness is is giving up your right to be right. I'll just tell you that um, this talk is, is really personal for me, and I don't have time to go into all the details about it, but I'll just tell you this. Uh, for five years, I gave five years of my 20s to unforgiveness, and it ate my soul away. There were uh, three people that I felt really wronged by in my life, and uh, it, was a, it was a traumatic event, moment, at least for me in my life. And um, 
I let anger, bitterness, and resentment move into my soul and make themselves at home. And like a weed, they spread throughout my soul and overtook anything healthy. And the, the, the overflow of those things in my life was uh, it consumed all of my thoughts. Uh, a cloud of drama followed me around. I mean, I wore my friends and my wife out, just constantly talking about the hurt that I felt, but never being willing to do anything about it. It was just continually rehearsing my pain with my wife and my friends, just constantly rehearsing it. So I became a problem spreader instead of a problem solver. And I wanted, I, when, when the people that had wronged me, when they, when they experienced um, pain in their own lives, there was some sense of gratification inside of me. All sorts of things misfired inside of me. And you know what? For five years, I believed that forgiveness wasn't possible, that reconciliation wasn't possible. And the person who got hurt the most by my anger, resentment, and bitterness was me, no doubt. And after five years, I think God got to a point where he was like, enough, like I'm so tired of seeing you get robbed. I think God in his kindness was like, I just, I want my child to have his joy back. And so God kind of forced me into some conversations with these three men. And they were amazing conversations where I came to them and I said, I need you to know, here is how you hurt me. And I gave them an opportunity to make it right. And they asked my forgiveness. But you know what I had to do? I had to ask their forgiveness for the ways that I had talked about them unrightfully with other people, by the way that I had harbored bitterness and resentment against them. And the cool thing now is that God has reconciled those relationships. They, each of those people I would consider a friend and God has brought us back together. And he's brought those relationships. He's mended those relationships. That won't be everyone's story here, but it's my story. The sad part about my story is that it took me five years to realize that there was joy waiting on the backside of forgiveness. See, forgiven people forgive people. But it took me five years to realize that there was joy waiting for me in a place that I couldn't see. Don't let it take you five years. And if it's been five years for you, don't let it be six. Would you develop eyes to see? Would you begin to believe this morning that there is actually joy waiting for you on the backside of forgiveness? So maybe some of you need to hear, you know what, don't major in the minors. If there's a minor offense, forgive it. Don't major in it. Don't major in the minors. That's, that's for some of you here this morning. For others of you, maybe it's just really realizing, yeah, that hurt, that pain is deep. And if you wait until you feel like forgiving, that moment will never come. And maybe it's been long enough now where you're at a point where it's like you need to choose to forgive. And then for others of you, the pain is still too deep and it's still too fresh. And so maybe for you, it's just coming to a place where you get a vision for what could be. And your prayer begins to be, God, I'm not there yet, but I want to get there. Would you help me take a step? May we be people this morning who simply take a step towards forgiveness, believing that joy is waiting for us, where God will meet us when we choose to forgive. Let's pray together. With your eyes closed, let me just say this. Some of you here this morning just need to realize that the greatest broken relationship in your life this morning is your relationship with God. 
that maybe you're realizing that you've actually never experienced the forgiveness of God because you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and this morning you want to experience that complete forgiveness of everything that you've ever done or ever will do, if that's you, would you just slip up your hand real quick, just with eyes closed, so I know who I'm talking to in this place this morning. And if that's you, I just want to invite you in the quietness of your own heart to receive God's forgiveness. Just say, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life today? Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead for me. Would you forgive me of all of my sins? Would you make me new today? And would you begin to lead me in a new way? And for everyone else here this morning, I just want to ask you, who came to mind when I said, who do you have bad blood with in your life? If anyone came to mind, don't move past that. I just want to invite you, even in this moment, to take a step. Just say, God, what step do you want me to take? Maybe you just need to take this moment and say, God, would you give me the courage to choose to forgive? Wherever it is, wherever you're at, would you believe today that there's joy waiting for you on the backside of forgiveness? Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done so that we could experience complete forgiveness. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. Lord, we thank you that you have everything we need, Lord God, to experience joy and wholeness. And thank you that you can supply us with the power that we need to choose to forgive others in our lives. And so I pray that as we leave in just a few minutes, Lord, if possible, Lord, knowing that there's times it won't be possible, but as far as it depends on us, would you help us to be at peace with all men and women? In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young and old pastor here at FaithBridge, sitting here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a sermon called The Devil Wears Unforgiveness. Uh, We have a few questions in, uh, and so I'll just start with the first one. Uh, The first one says, what are some practical steps for someone to take toward forgiveness when the offender is either not around or unsafe to be around? Yeah, so if... There, there are unique times in extreme circumstances mm-hmm. where it will be more uh, hurtful than helpful to, to, to take a step towards a reconciling conversation that's, right. that's in person. And so, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different scenarios out there. It might be someone has a parent that's deceased and they still feel, mm-hmm. someone feels really wounded. But, so it's kind of how do you gain closure with someone that isn't even around? Um, or it could be that someone is still alive, but it's just not best for you to right. to meet with them. Um, you know, I would I would encourage a few things, and in each scenario is different. If the hurt runs really deep, I strongly encourage people to get professional counseling. Mm-hmm. That we all need counseling. The Holy Spirit is called the counselor. And God puts it inside of us probably mm-hmm. because he knew we would all need counseling. Right. So, And so I strongly encourage you. I've been to counseling myself. I will probably go back to counseling mm-hmm. at some point. And so I encourage people to process through things with a professional yeah. counselor. You know, one thing that I've encouraged people to do if they have a, someone that is deceased that they can't have that closure is to write a letter to that person mm-hmm. still 
and I would write it and give it to a friend mm -hmm. um, just so that, that you're getting what's inside, outside of right. you, and it's being read yeah. by somebody. And so I, I would encourage that, and I would actually encourage that even with somebody that it's unsafe for you to be around mm -hmm. them. Write a letter <clears throat> and, and have someone read the letter to that person, mm -hmm. or write a letter that never gets sent, but you give it to someone else, that it, it at least is, it's getting what's inside outside of you yeah if that makes sense no yeah that's so helpful that's the first step in it you know it's it's always good to to deal with these things in the context of community i can think about a relationship in my past it was a it was a previous dating relationship mm -hmm. it wasn't unsafe physically unsafe mm -hmm. but it just wasn't healthy for right. us to get back in the same room to have that conversation so i wrote a letter to her mm -hmm. and had and someone else read it to her and that was that was how we you know I kept my side of the street clean and it was it was actually really therapeutic for yeah. me to do that's so helpful that's so helpful yeah uh, well we have one other question and it's uh, regarding at the end of point three you were talking about kind of trust and forgiveness where are the boundaries and they just asked could you kind of expand a little bit upon upon that yeah my my point was that you don't have to trust someone again to completely forgive them mm -hmm. you actually don't need the other person to do anything for you to forgive them forgiveness is a choice you make to release someone for what they did to you it doesn't mean that you forget what they did to you it just means that you release them from it and you get to a point where you can wish them well right you can want for Jesus to be at work in their life. You can want them to know Jesus and walk with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, even if they're in prison, you can want that mm -hmm. for them. And that's forgiveness. It's, it's releasing them from that and refusing to hold it against them right. in your thought life or even in your actions. Now, the, the hope is that forgiveness and trust would go hand in hand, but mm -hmm. that isn't always possible. I hope it's possible if there's you know, a marriage that is fractured, that forgiveness, even if there's an infidelity, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you immediately forgive and trust mm -hmm. that person. Trust is something that grows right. over time as the person shows themselves to be trustworthy. Right. But there's certain situations, like <clears throat> if there has been, you know, abuse of a minor, if someone mm -hmm. experienced uh, abuse as a child, it might never be appropriate to, to trust that person, right. meaning they don't let that person have a access to their life to potentially mm -hmm. hurt them again. And that is okay, mm -hmm. but forgiveness is still, mm -hmm. is still possible, right. if right. that makes sense. And so, you know, it's good to put, to put boundaries where boundaries are necessary. Mm -hmm. I work with college students and a lot of times, you know, the greatest unhealthiness that I see is in a toxic dating relationship. Mm -hmm. And you know what, if a guy or a girl, it can happen both ways, is, is unhealthy and, and has conducted themselves in other relationships that just, it, it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. It's okay to forgive that person, but you don't need to be friends with that person. Yeah. That's trusting them with your heart and your mind again, and that's just not not necessary. Yeah, that idea of like there's there's wisdom in boundaries, wisdom in that earning yep. back of trust and wisdom and forgiveness never gonna be at, yep. at odds. Uh, yeah, and, and there's times where you might let people back into your life, but you still have boundaries yeah. in, in place. That even if you guys are able to forgive each other and the relationship is reconciled, y'all might never get close enough again to mm -hmm. share certain things. Mm -hmm. Right. If that makes sense. Definitely does. Wonderful. Well, thank you, um, TA, for that sermon. Uh, we're excited to have you back next week. Um, excited to hear what you have uh, to bring for us then. Uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you back next week. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.